Okay. All right. So, um, so this work was again done by Jason. Um, it, it built on a, a previous work, and there is actually um, more work since. And I should have actually Sam Dillabu's name on this as well because he has a realization of a network that actually does it um, in the lab, um, which is sort of fun. Um, uh, so, uh, which I'm not talking about today because it's a flow network and this talk is, is uh, only about mechanical networks. Um, so uh, before I start though, I just want to um, have a little ad here for um, the Center for Soft and Letty Be Matter, which uh, just started in January. It brings together over 60 faculty from more than 10 departments across Penn. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, come join us because um, uh, we're having a great time. So the idea is this, this center will, will bring us together uh, and see collaborations within the center. We already are extremely collaborative. Um, uh, but, uh, and then we will do, there's shared equipment for people who are in this, uh, within the center and so forth. Uh, and the possibility to work jointly with more than one person, if you come as a postdoc, for example. All right. Um, so, um, just want to put this in context, right? The whole point of, of many of us as, um, uh, living matter, biological physicist, right, is really to sort of gain a microscopic understanding of collective phenomena, emerging collective phenomena. And um, the tool that uh, we've used, um, that has been used for over a century, right, very, very successfully, is to use statistical mechanics where you take microstate information, okay, and you reduce that. That's a dimensionality reduction problem to take all that huge amount of information and reduce it down to just average just invariances, really distributions of relative of relevant microscopic quantities. Um, and that's what StatMech has done for us. But there are a lot of problems that are resistant to statistical mechanics. And data science methods are they specialize in dimensional reduction. And so the question is, can we use them to do statistical mechanics okay, to accomplish our, our goal. And so um, I'm gonna talk about um, now mechanical allosteria or protein allosteria, okay? Um, and this is used by many proteins, uh, signaling proteins, enzymes, et cetera. Um, and the idea is the following. So this is an example of an enzyme that is turned on by allosteric. So here I have my substrate molecule that wants to bind to this protein and get chemically modified by it, okay? But right now it can't bind. It can't bind until this other molecule, this regulatory molecule binds over here. And once that happens, then this is, that changes the conformation of protein that allows this thing to bind and it turns on the enzyme, okay? So um, the weird thing about this is that you're, when you think about what you're doing when you're binding it is you're applying a strain, okay, here, okay? And you're getting a strain over here at the target, which is comparable to the strain at the source, which is order one compared to the strain at the source. And you say, okay, well, no problem. You know, elasticity is long ranged. It can handle that. But actually deformation decays very rapidly with distance. Uh, and uh, typically this, what you would expect would be, you know, a strain of, you know, 10 to the minus two, 10 to the minus three of the source strain, given the distance, okay, across the protein. Um, so, uh, so getting a strain here that's of order one compared to the source is special. So when I think about statistical physics, right, it's really comfortable with cases where we have, you know, identical components or a few classes of identical components or totally random components. But, you know, for this problem, if I wanna understand the collective phenomenon, which is protein allosteric, okay. Okay, first of all, there are lots of different components and their sequence is not at all random. Okay, it's not periodic, you know, it's not crystalline or uniform and it's also not random. And it was actually chosen by this process okay, in order to have this function. 
So if I think about trying to use data science to look at this, right? First of all, I need lots of data. Secondly, I know from statistical mechanics, I need ensembles. And I need ensembles that do the thing I want to look at. I need these designed or evolved ensembles and they have to be big. And if you say, okay, well, I have protein families across species, which is what people usually rely on to get you know, an ensemble, that's a tiny ensemble, okay, to answer a question like this. And as, as you saw from the, the tutorial, right, uh, we needed lots and lots of flow networks in order to see what was going on. So um, we designed these networks and we designed the flow and mechanical networks actually the same way. So the idea is since there, there is a community of people, very healthy community that takes folded proteins and turns them into spring networks, mechanical networks, okay? We're not gonna do that, okay? We're gonna start out with our own networks, okay? In 2D and 3D, okay? And we're going to tune them. So the networks don't initially have this property that if I apply a source strain here, I get a target strain there, I could desire target strain there, okay? They don't initially have that, but I'm going to now tune all of these networks to have that. And how do you do that? So that was the question that came up in the tutorial. So the idea is you use basically the same way that people do, you know, for example, tune deep learning networks, okay, uh, for machine learning. It's a constraint satisfaction problem. So the idea is the following. You have constraints. As you say, I want my target strain to be at least delta. That's a constraint. And what you do is you construct a cost function that penalizes you if you don't meet the constraint. So if my target, if the strain at the target is less than delta, then I pay a price. Okay. And now what you do is you minimize this cost function with respect to your degrees of freedom. And what are your degrees of freedom? I'm gonna call these learning degrees of freedom. They are, for example, in this case, the stiffnesses of the edges. Okay, so I have central four spring networks and each spring has a stiffness K and I'm gonna tune K, okay, uh, tune the, the, the spring constants of each of these in order to minimize this cost function. I'm gonna use gradient descent, okay. And so, um, all right, um, I saw a hand went up, sorry. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, just just unmute so, yourself and butt in, please. Oh, yeah. sure. Uh, so in this case, uh, could you uh, elaborate a bit on uh, what the nodes and edges represent? It's not just the covalent interactions, is it? Yeah, so, I'm, so, that's, so that's right. Um, when, people, when people do this for proteins, uh, sorry too far. When people do this for proteins, they have, you know, uh, covalent interactions, they have electrostatic interactions, Van der Waals, you know, polar, all, I mean, all these kinds of things. Um, uh, hydrogen bonding, they have all of these things when they do that. But um, we're not doing case, that though. In this case, the graph is flattened or um, is this just... uh, no, I'm just drawing it in two dimensions. We do also three dimensional networks. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we don't do this. We don't start with real proteins and then use the interactions to turn them into spring networks. We just start with spring networks. Okay, we just start with disordered spring networks in 2D and 3D. Okay, this is just a picture of a 2D one. And then we tune them according to this thing. Okay. So whether this is realistic or not is a different question, right? Because we're not tuning them. So this is, would correspond to an electrostatic interaction between two atoms at this distance, okay? We're just tuning the stiffnesses. Yeah, another question. Uh, can I ask a related question? So, yeah. uh, so are, the, uh, are there, it's free joints in the nodes? Is it free joints? Yes, for these, which are they're just central spring four spring networks with no angle bending. But we have also done this. Uh, this was done the paper where Juan de Pablo is the last author, Daniel Reed is the first author in PNAS, where um, uh, we put in angle bending interactions. And um, you can, in that case, we're tuning Poisson ratio, not Allosteri, but, um, but it worked there. So in this case, there are no angle bendings here. In this case, there are no angle bending. That's right. But 
we have done this in three in two dimensional and three dimensional realizations. So you can take networks, and this is work by Nidhi Pashin and Sid Nagel's lab. So you take these networks, okay? For example, a network like this that has been tuned, okay? Uh, in that case, they only tune, everything has the same spring constant, and we just tune by just saying, by uh, allowing this, this bond to be present or absent, okay? So it's just a binary variable. Our degrees of freedom are just that the edge can be there or not there, okay? And, um, and then uh, in this paper, in fact, um, uh, Nidhi Pashin uh, laser cut 2D networks, okay? And then showed that if you apply the source strain, indeed, you still get the target strain. And that's a real system. It has angle bending and all those things. And she 3D printed um, three-dimensional networks and was able to do that as well. So it's, it's quite robust, but, we, but for what I'm gonna talk about, it's just central core spring networks. Okay. Um, so this is, now I'm just tuning the string constants. This is just like what I showed before, but now this is a mechanical network. The target strain, you notice, started at, uh, at 0 0.005, I think. Anyway, it's very small compared to the source. And now as we tune the stiffnesses, it goes up and it does eventually reach the value of one. Okay. So, um, so in fact, we can do this extremely successfully. So with well over 99% success rate, we can take a network and tune it to have a response here that's as large as the source string, okay? And actually very few bonds need to be involved in, in this. Uh, in fact, when we looked at networks of uh, about uh, a thousand edges, several hundred, uh, 700 edges, I believe, um, uh, and you and you tune by just you know removing bonds, just pruning bonds. We on average had to remove five in order to get a response of one in a three dimensional network. Okay, so really quite modest changes to the network to get this. So now we have the designed ensembles. So what do we want to know, right? And this is the origin of the question that I asked in the tutorial. What's the microscopic you know, how does this microscopic tuning lead to the collective function of allosteric? And this is particularly interesting for protein allosteric, where lots of proteins have the same folding structure, but different signaling functions, okay, or allosteric functions. And other proteins have similar functions, but totally different folding structures. And we're starting from different networks, and yet they all do the same thing, right? Um, so, you know, what is this structure function connection? So, I'm not. I'm going to skip this because we. I already talked about it in the tutorial. Um, I wasn't sure how many people would attend both, but I think it's about the same. So, um, so you've already seen the idea for that it works. What we did for flow networks yeah. using Chris's homology. Yeah. yeah. So, Question. Yeah, yeah. So how this mechanism works for if you have multiple target nodes, if you want to tune multiple target nodes at the same time. Yeah, so, well, that's what we have here, in fact, right on this very slide for the flow networks, right? It divides not into two sectors, but into multiple sectors where the target nodes span boundaries between sectors. Okay, so then you have this multiple cost function for the same time, or it will become non ah, Then the, how, how do we do it? Yes, um, in the cost function, yeah. it's the sum of all of the different targets. So we just have this term for each target. We have what is its actual strain and what is the desired strain. And it could be different for different targets. And then we just, the total cost function is the sum over all of these. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. All right. So, um, all right. So now what's the difference between flow and mechanical networks? Well, in flow networks, if you look at this, the sectors, Okay, I can look at these sectors where I have, you know, nearly uniform node pressure, this sector and this sector, right? Or I could look at pathways of edges where I have nearly uniform, very high pressure drops. Okay, so these form these pathways. And the, the information that I get from the sectors and the pathways is the same because the pressure drops live on the edges. Okay, and the pressure drops are edges that connect nodes. 
But strain is a different thing. Strain is more delocalized, right? Strain is defined over a region. And because it's defined over a region, what you get, so remember that these sectors come from doing the ascending filtration, where we go up in pressure, then we see these basins of nearly uniform uh, node pressures or, or very similar uh, small pressure drops, okay? Um, and uh, whereas in this, what you get in the descending filtration are these cracks, right? These boundaries. And so in the flow networks, the ascending and descending filtration give you the same information actually. But in the mechanical networks, they don't, okay? And so um, this is a picture of a 3D system that has been tuned uh, with a source and a target, okay? And, um, and uh, it, it, it has been in tuned and now these are the displacements, okay, are uh, corresponding to uh, the difference between having the source, applying the source and not applying the source. Okay, so that's the sort of string. Um, and now, uh, and that's what's plotted here, okay? Uh, the color here indicates the amount of string. And now what you can do is you can identify the, the boundary between the sectors. Okay, we'll call that the hinge. Um, and you can look at a pathway, which we call the hinge pathway, okay, that connects the smallest strain within this sector to the smallest strain within that sector, okay, with a pathway of minimal strain all, all along the way, okay? And then at some point you look and you say, which was the maximum strain that I, in, occur, that, that I saw along the pathway that occurs at the hinge, okay? I call that epsilon hinge. So that's the maximum strain that you, occur, that you find on this pathway of minimal strains connecting this minimum strain point to that minimum strain point. Now, we compare that to epsilon star, which is the maximum strain at the source and the target or, tar and tar or targets, right? So that's sort of how big it could possibly be. Sets so a scale of you know how big it could be, and we look at that ratio, okay, of this hinge strain to epsilon star. And you can see that if this is a really strong hinge, if there's really a clear difference between the two sectors, then epsilon h is going to be over over epsilon star is going to be of order one. Whereas if it's really not very hingy at all, okay. Uh, then this is going to be small. So this tells us how important that hinge sort of is. The other thing, so people have, so people have talked about um, sort of, they're often called force chains, but they're really um, these strain pathways where if you poke the source, for example, that pokes the next one, that pokes the next one, and then that pokes out the, the target, right? That's another way to get a large strain. And, uh, and that is actually the strain pathway that is what you get from the descending filtration, okay? Uh, and here we construct that strain pathway by taking the pathway of maximum strain that connects the source to target, okay? And now if you look at the smallest strain that you incur along that pathway that you, that you come across in that pathway, okay? Uh, and you compare that to, again, the maximum strain at the source target, okay? What you can see is that the larger, larger that is, the more important the strain pathway is, okay? In other words, if all of the strains here are very large, then it's like here, I'm poking the source and it pokes out at the target, okay? That strain is just communicated along that pathway to the target, okay? So now we can take all of our networks, Okay, and we can look at them in this two-dimensional space where we plot the ratio of the hinge strain, okay, epsilon h to epsilon star, this hinge scale to the strain pathway scale. We plot them along in this two-dimensional sort of phase diagram, okay? And we've done this again for lots and lots of networks. And this is a heat map showing where the different networks land in this two-dimensional space. And the interesting thing is that we can go through all of our realizations and we can find examples of what people have 
come up with in the literature for allosteric mechanisms. For example, there's a scissor mechanism, okay, where, you know, the nodes here come together and the nodes over here come out, okay, sort of a scissor sort of thing. That's this one, okay? Where does this fall? Okay, that's that triangle that's there, okay? So it's pretty strong on the hinge scale and pretty strong on that pathway scale, sort of comparable in the hinge and pathway, okay? Another, the other one I, I mentioned, people have talked about the strain pathways in actual allosteric proteins, okay? Uh, we can find pathway examples, okay? Uh, where is that on this? The pathway, okay, is this point here. So the hinge part, the sectors are not significant at all, but the pathway is very significant. It's, it's high on the scale, okay? Um, uh, another, uh, people talk about shear uh, or twist, where you, for example, twist, you just take the, the, the two parts, this is the example here, okay? You take the, the top half and the bottom half and they just twist relative to each other. Okay, and that's how this the source strain uh, is the same as uh, comparable to the target strain. Okay, um, uh, where does that appear? Okay, that appears up here. All right, quite a strong pathway, but also uh, reasonably strong, strong on hinge, and and so forth. And so you see all these distinct mechanisms that people have talked about for allosteric proteins. Okay, but what you see from here is that in fact, if you look at thousands of these, they are not distinct. There is a continuum, okay? And the right way to think about them is not to try to classify them. They don't fall into discrete clumps, which you can then classify in terms of different mechanisms, which is how things have been done so far in talking about protein allosteric. That's not the way, right way to talk about it. They are not falling into discrete clumps. They are falling into this continuum and What's a useful way of describing them is in terms of these two numbers, the hinge scale and the pathway scale. It's a different way of sort of classifying or, or characterizing the mechanism of Alistair is in terms of these two numbers. So, um, and this works. So just as before I showed you that the, if you look at the, in the flow networks, if you look at the average node pressure in, in one sector, uh, and the difference of that and the average no pressure in the other sector, that that, the, that difference very closely approximates um, the actual tuned in difference. Similarly here, this just shows that uh, what you get from the sectors, the hinges, okay, the sectors, sorry, in the mechanical case, uh, really has a very high overlap with, with, with the actual target string. Um, and as soon as the hinge persistence gets reasonably large, and that it's still quite small here, you see as soon as the hinge persistence uh, scale gets up to about um, uh, a, a few percent, okay, I already have very large overlap. I'm already quite well predicting the actual motion at the target. The other thing we see is the sensitivity. Um, Sorry, you're listening to me. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, no question. Okay. So, um, so uh, yeah, the other thing we see is how sensitive is this to, to what is sort of the susceptibility uh, to changes? So for example, if we, if we, instead of having the actual strain at that node, if we freeze that strain to be uh, in, in, in a given region, that's uh, to be zero. Okay. And we, and that, and look at the distance of that region to the actual hinge, okay, or pathway. What you see is that how much does that change the actual strain at the target? In other words, how much, how much does this, how sensitive is this allosteric function to a change, which I can think of as a mutation, for example, change that amino acid. How do, how much does that change uh, the response, right? In this case, we're just freezing uh, this strain, setting it to zero. Okay, um, and what you see is that it depends quite sensitively on the distance from the hinge. So the red is the distance from the hinge, okay? It decays very rapidly with distance from the hinge. So it makes the most difference if it's near the hinge. Or if I have a pathway, okay, it makes the most difference if it's near the path, 
if I have a straight pathway, it makes the most difference if it's near the path. So what can we say about real proteins? So the nice thing about this analysis is that in the end, you just, all you need is the, the protein structure with and without the regulatory molecule. In other words, you need to know what difference, what happens when you apply the source strain. Okay, in other words, when you bind the regulatory molecule. And there are a number of proteins uh, in the protein database where that information is there. Okay, and so what Jason did was to look at those proteins. Okay, so here are our design proteins. And he looked at the real proteins and say, okay, where do they land on this hinge scale versus strain pathway scale plot? Okay, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and how well does that work? Okay, so if, uh, so for example, I can look at the proteins um, and look at the overlap of, you know, the, the response at the target with what you would predict from the sectors, okay, which I said, okay, it, it very rapidly captures, you know, most of that strain point, you know, up to point eight of that strain. Uh, and you see for the, the actual proteins that, yeah, it actually captures that very, very well, uh, as long as the hinge scale is large enough. Sorry, this is not rescaled, so it's actual numbers, uh, not rescaled by epsilon star. Okay, um, so um, so it actually does work quantitatively reasonably well for real proteins. The other thing is that you know the susceptibility of the of the target response to a change. Uh, if you look at where the most conserved amino acids are, okay, this is glucokinase, where we had these very well defined sectors. Um, uh, you, you see that the most conserved ones, which are the whitest ones, okay, this is on a white to blue, dark blue scale, uh, the most conserved ones are in fact near the hinge. So, um, so we think this, this could actually tell us something about real proteins. Now, what's the one big difference between the real proteins and our design mechanical networks, right, is that real proteins are not spherical. Of course, we did spheres because we're physicists. Um, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and that, you know, could be why you have these points here, which are, you know, which they're, they're, far, they're, they're these points that are well below the diagonal, where this, they don't seem to appear, there aren't that many below the diagonals for the spherical ones. Um, Can I ask you a quick question yeah. about this diagram that you have up here? You said that the, the, the white spheres are the most conserved. Is that the most unchanged by, a conformational change in the, in the protein? No, these are just conserved across the species. This is the oh, usual, oh. usual meaning of conservation. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So, um, okay. So remember we had these design ensembles and we wanted to answer this question, right? And what this tells us that what we learned from this analysis was that edge tuning affects the topological structure of the response. And that what's really nice is the most topologically significant features, in other words, these sectors, the hinges between the sectors, the strain pathways, are the ones that appear to be responsible for function. Um, and the nice thing is that we did all this. We did this on our design proteins where we had lots and lots of data so we could figure out what to do. But once we did it, right, we had this dimensional reduction that we, we reduced the allosteric mechanism down to two variables, okay? And then once we had this, we were able to apply it to real systems, okay? And what we learned from that, what we learned from all of this, right, is that the allosteric mechanisms are, are not distinct. They don't fall into distinct classes. There really is a continuum and that this way of classifying them in terms, uh, characterizing them in terms of these two variables is a better way to, to think about it. Um, so uh, just with that, uh, give credit to uh, the people who are involved in, in, in this whole program um, and particularly uh, Jason. <laughs>